So uh, if Dr. George Baker, if you would come up, and Frank Koza uh, from PGM Interconnection. So, uh, so fr Frank can, will be able to answer a question about transformer reserves. But just to, so Dr. George Baker was at the Defense Nuclear Agency for decades and uh, was the principal designer of the military standard, mill standard 125, 188, and others. And he, after the end of the Cold War, well, at the end of nuclear testing in 1992, he was a principal initiator of this ELECTRA program, which tried to develop an assessment methodology to review how well we could assess EMP effects by looking at and then doing sub-component testing of our uh, defense weapon systems. And uh, he could tell you a little about, it turned out they weren't much better than coin flippers. So we ended up, it was a major initiative to do actual tests to failure. Uh, Frank Koza has been uh, one of the leaders in the electric utility industry involved in transmission and, tra and system planning for PJM interconnection, uh, and which is, I think, something like 21, per their service area, 13 states in the District of Columbia, uh, serves something like 20, the service area is roughly 21% of gross domestic product. It's, it's the largest electric market in the world, and it's currently a leader in developing uh, capacity pricing, so which is now, there's, current initiatives to reform capacity markets to give uh, incentives for resilience. We're, we're expecting a decision out of FERC on December 11th on that. And uh, so Frank also played a major role of chairing the GMD task force of NERC and I believe is involved in the EMP uh, research program of EPRI. So I, whoever wants to go first, maybe Frank. Well, on let, me, let me address, try to address a couple of questions that were posed to Dr. Graham first. First of all, I think there was a question back there about interchangeability of the large power transformers. Generally, they're not interchangeable. And, and the reason for that is they're designed in an optimal design kind of configuration. So we're trying to get the maximum throughput in the transformer. So for the most part, they're not interchangeable. With that said, there's now an effort, because of the kind of concerns we've been talking about today, to try to do in some fashion, begin to standardize in certain voltages and certain designs to make sure that, not that they're gonna be necessarily interchangeable, but certainly more interchangeable than, than they are today. So, so that's what's going on in that area. The other question was about um, stockpiling and, and spare transformers. There are a number, there are spare transformers out in the system, not, not great in number. If you go to large, you know, 500 kV, the, the, the largest substations, you'll generally see one transformer sitting there, generally a spare. So um, I, I don't want anybody to walk away thinking there's spare coverage for a large portion of the, of the fleet. There certainly isn't, but there are some spares out there. And I guess the last question was about the foreign manufacturer issue. Um, it, it's true, most of, the, of the, trans, the large power transformers come from manufacturers outside the United States. Um, where's John Ostrich? Uh, uh, there was an effort at DOE. I know uh, George Fried Friedman was working on that. And I know that, that the amount of domestic manufacturer has now increased from where it was, I think, you know, five, 10 years ago. But it's certainly a large portion it still comes from foreign manufacturers. So, George, I don't know if you had any, any other comments you wanted to ask. Right. Uh, I'm told uh, that uh, we're, we actually, some of our big transformer manufacturers who had closed shop are now recapitalizing their plants. And there are uh, a plant that I heard about in Tennessee that can build uh, you know, anything up to 765 kV. Uh, so we are trying to bring back that manufacturing capability into the United States, which I think is a very good sign, and hopefully that you know that will continue. <laughs> so I guess Bill, you wanted me to talk about the EPRI work, right? Okay. All right. I'm I'm standing in for Randy Horton, by the way. 
who is the project manager for the EPRI work. Um, my knowledge of the EPRI project, first of all, it's a, it's a multi-year project, and, and to get to Dr. Graham's point, it's the slow, expensive way, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it is the, the e pardon me? It's the, it's the slow, expensive way that Dr. Graham talked about. It, it's, the, it's the industry in its arm, which is the Electric Power Research Institute, trying to, I'll say, bring us the information we feel is needed for us to address the EMP situation. Uh, what that looks like is a large number of utilities in the U.S. will fund the project. And I think Randy mentioned yesterday there are 61 utilities funding his EPRI project uh, on EMP. So um, what he's done so far is he has kind of focused on the transformers. Um, I think they put out a report earlier this year that, that kind of talked about the risk to the large power transformers. I I'm just going to kind of brutally kind of generalize what it said, and it, and it was that in an EMP kind of situation, a number of transformers would fail. I don't think anybody should be surprised by that. What it did not say was a huge number of transformers will simultaneously fail. Um, I think the, the important thing, thing to take away, and, and my analogy is always about the flu. When the medical community is warning about the flu, they say if you're elderly and if you're chronically ill, you have a larger chance of, of a problem with the flu. Same is true with transformers. If, it's, if the transformer is elderly and has health issues, that's, those are the transformers that are likely to fail. And I would expect in any kind of an EMP situation, there are going to be transformer failures, no question about it. Whether there are enough to cause a cascading um, outage across the power system, I don't think we know that yet, but that gets, that, that gets back to analysis of the power system that we can do given our models and try to figure that out. So Randy's work so far is to focus on the transformers. Where he is right now is he is testing, and, and, and Dr. Graham kind of talked about a little bit, the issue of the control systems for the power network. And uh, we, we've talked about solid state, the, the vulnerability of solid state. Uh, digital devices, they're all over the power system in the form of digital relays. Uh, the question is what, what's the survivability of those devices? That's where he's focused right now. And the fact is it's not just the device itself, which, is, which has some potential to be damaged in the, in the E1, but the fact, and just as Dr. Graham talked about, the fact that there are large antennas in the forms of control cables that are connected to all those devices, and you put those two together, you know, what, what will survive it, uh, in, in an EMP event. That's where he's kind of focused right now. And quite frankly, from an industry perspective, that's where we need the most immediate help. And, and quite frankly, if the DOD already had the answer, it'd be beautiful if that could be shared with us. But in the absence of that, um, that's where Randy's focused right now. Will the control devices survive, and what's the impact of those large wire antennas that are connected to all those devices? So um, in a nutshell, that, that's kind of what, what Randy's work is doing. And I guess while I'm up here, I might as well talk about on the other side of the, of the coin. The other threat to the power system is what I'll call the network threat, and that is will the, uh, the EM, EMP event cause voltage depressions to the point where a large cascading outage will ripple across the whole system. Um, what, what's being talked about, what, what work is going on there is that FERC has directed NERC to develop a research plan to kind of look at all the inputs that go into those kind of analyses, verify what's necessary, what can be done, and so we can get some confidence in that the network analysis that we need to do will give us you know, representative answers of whether an EMP will cause that kind of wide-scale rippling effect across the system. So, so that's what's kind of kind of going on on the FERC and the NERC side. I talked about the EPRI, and with that, I guess I'll turn it over to George. All right. Well, I had something. Um, why don't you just uh, because Dr. Horton w couldn't speak, and Frank was not really prepared to give his full talk. I, I want to add. Uh, so EPRI uh, was able to take. A research report from the former deputy director of Los Alamos, Conrad Longmire, who uh, set up a company called Mission Research Corporation, and that uh, that report suggested that the E3 
hazard to large power transformers would be roughly 24 volts per kilometer. And, if, and so EPRI has modeled that threat level against a wide variety of transformers. So you can't just, they have to do it transformer type by transformer type. And they, in the February report put out on February 21st, it's available on the EPRI website for anyone who cares, they estimated that looking just at the thermal effects, r three to 14 transformers out of about 2,500 would appear to be uh, likely to suffer serious damage or total failure, uh, but that's a relatively low, low number and they would be geographically dispersed. So the thermal effects do not, from that study, do not appear to be high. Uh, there was, but they, uh, a cautionary remark was that the, this did not look at the relationship between E1 and E3. And you heard Dr. Graham earlier indicate that the damage from E1 can then, if you can have uh, relays that are closed and in place, and your own power can dam in the E3 phase can take out your own equipment. So there's an important E1, E3 relationship that EPRI says it has not modeled yet. So that's important to have as background. And Dr. Baker can say a little something, but Dr. Graham put up this Radasky report, and we are waiting for security clearance of the Radasky report. So I think Dr. Baker will tell you as much as he can about a, an alternative view in which the EMP Commission, taking that Russian data that EPRI doesn't have, uh, which is thought to be better data because it's over land, not over water. Uh, and so, uh, George, why don't you pick up from All here? Right. I had some charts if they're available. So I have to start with an anecdote, and uh, Frank, uh, I, uh, just, uh, if I want to talk about a, a, an encounter that we had. We had been, Frank and I had been on a, uh, at a uh, conference at Idaho National Labs, and, um, uh, and on the flight back from, uh, I think it was from Idaho Falls to Minneapolis. Uh, uh, I got on the, the flight and I looked at my ticket and it was uh, something like row 16, seat B, and I start walking down the aisle and I see Frank is in is in on the flight and he's got th this uh, sort of cringy, you know, looking like he wants to hide under his seat because he realizes that I'm going to sit down next to him. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, and uh, you know, having been in the EMP, doing EMP for uh, 45 years now, I'm used to people hiding under their desks. Uh, this is the first time I'd see, I saw somebody trying to hide under their, their airplane, their airplanes. But we had a great. It was a wonderful conversation. We we were on the flight. Uh, I guess it was lasted about 90 minutes, and we came to the conclusion that there's a huge overlap in the Venn diagrams of what the electric power industry wants and what the EMP community wants. And uh, I, have, uh, I have huge respect for the electric power industry, and I think there's just a lot of, uh, of uh, overlap, a lot of room for cooperation. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit in this, in this brief. So, uh, so Bill, Bill I uh, gave you a little bit more of the, his, the philosophical, historical uh, uh, picture and what I want to do, I'm going to talk about some of the specific deliberations of the uh, EMP Commission. I have to be careful because the, the reports are still under classification review, so I have to be a little bit mealy mouth, in, both in what I say and what the words on the charts here. So please forgive me up front. Here. So uh, next, uh, well, you can see the pictures there. I think this is the world. I'm trying to capture the some of the world issues <laughs> relative to EMP on the front front chart there. Uh, ne uh, next chart. Oh, is there, oh, there's a clicker. Oh. All right. Gee, and is, is there a uh, laser pointer on there? Okay. So, uh, and, uh, and I hope you can read these. Um, 
so uh, first point is that the, the infrastructure uh, uh, faces this growing uh, uh, existential uh, uh, threat from not just EMP, but uh, 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 a combined set of threats, including uh, EMP, cyber, and uh, also physical attacks, and uh, uh, we also have to conclude the you know, RF weapon type effects. Um, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the uh, we've heard, heard from, uh, uh, from uh, the uh, GMD uh, folks as well, Mur Mur uh, Murtal today. Uh, the, uh, the, our, the, nation, the nation's adversaries have described uh, their uh, EMP capability in terms of combined arms warfare, and uh, in, in including uh, a, a, a attack that would uh, incorporate multiple uh, uh, sequential uh, use of these different, uh, uh, different uh, attack means. Um, and uh, a highly plausible result could be a very l large scale uh, uh, nationwide blackout of electric power. And I should mention that uh, you know this these, uh, this idea of, l of large scale uh, long term blackouts is not new. The uh, uh, back in the uh, 1990s uh, there were uh, some reports that came or, or in early 2000s uh, there were reports that came out of the National Security Count uh, Nas uh, sorry NSC staff. And uh, uh, that warned about this. I, they used the LTO, Long Term Outage acronym, and uh, uh, they were much concerned about it going way back. So this is nothing new. This, the, the, these uh, concerns uh, pre actually predated the the uh, EMP Commission. Um, and so uh, we need a, a multi hazard approach, and um, uh, that is doable. And one of the, I guess, one of the things I, I always need to uh, calm people down. It, I'm not saying that we are SOL. We, we can handle this, and uh, uh, we know how to do it. The, the engin engineers know how to protect. The, the, uh, uh, the, there are uh, very simple, conceptual, and al also uh, uh, off-the-shelf protection devices uh, that, that can be used. So don't, don't hear, any, don't, please don't under understand anything that the commission is talking about or that I'm saying as uh, is uh, you know we're all we're all doomed. That is not not the case. Just what's lacking at at, at this stage uh, at the federal level is is resolve. That's that's what we need to do. Uh, but the problem, yeah, the problem is that the uh, federal attention we find we've uncovered in, with the EMP Commission. We've reviewed a lot of the documents uh, concerning uh, 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 national preparedness for the, this kind of uh, effect, long 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 term outage effect, and we. we we see that the federal attention is is is, is hollow. That, that's probably the kindest uh, word I could I could think of, but but uh, there are reports out there that talk about national preparedness uh, at very high you know very high level reports that don't even mention EMP as, as part of the mix, and uh, that's very it was very troublesome. I, I know uh, Dr. Graham was 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 quite. Uh, uh, disturbed about about that. that the EMP is not making it. In, in fact, uh, you know, with the DHS, uh, uh, the, the, they have these planning scenarios that we, they never issue an EMP planning scenario, and EMP is not even among their top 100 threats. We were told they've got a list of 100 threats, and EMP is not even on the top 100 list. So, so there, there's this problem uh, that we have that needs needs to be corrected. Uh, we will be SOL if, they, if we don't get the, the uh, priority uh, that's needed here. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, we uh, still feel did, did back in the you know 2000 aughts and still feel that protecting and defending the the grid and, and uh, other critical infrastructures can be accomplished at a reasonable cost and. Uh, I've got a sort of a, uh, this, this was not a commission graph, but I've got a graph in the upper right hand corner. And uh, you know, we're, we're, if you, there's a sweet spot there. If you look at the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, potential costs of not protecting the country where you might lose, you know, be out of, the, the national enterprise might be down for a year. Our, I think our national cur current uh, GNP is maybe 17 trillion. So you're gonna measure the, the losses uh, in, in the, you know, in gross national products, okay, 
but there's a there's a there's the cost to protect we think would be uh, uh, less than one percent of the, the the potential losses if you had a you know a, a major outage. Uh, we feel that the DOD needs to increase its engagement and. Uh, uh, because they have the most knowledge. I'm not going to beat that because you, you've heard that over and over this morning. And, uh, and then uh, we also believe that the unclassified empirically based uh, E3 thread is needed and, and Bill Graham talked about that. Uh, and uh, we, we actually, there's the, there, there is a waveform. I've normalized it. I, don't, I, I know I can't because the report's still under review. I, I shouldn't put on the vertical scale of the uh, but there's a, there's a, a waveform that we're, we're recommending and hopefully will be made available to the uh, uh, in critical infrastructure uh, 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 communities. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, the, the other thing I, I need to, uh, right, on the prior view graph, um, what EPRI is using uh, for their analysis is, is uh, a factor of a few too low. And that, that's, a, that's a problem. I, there's, you know, and we, we talked with Randy Horton, and he, you know, he says he's set up so he, whatever waveform that, that uh, is, rec is recommended and approved, you know, he, can, he can run the models and is willing to do that. Um, there's a lot of regulatory impediments to EMP preparedness, um, institutional arrangements, and, and uh, w uh, with uh, FERC and NERC. Uh, and, and the main problem is just from a uh, policy standpoint, they are not set up uh, uh, to uh, address major national security threats, and that's a problem. And, and for us to expect them to be able to roll over and do, and do these things uh, uh, with all the present you know, legal uh, statutory restrictions uh, is unfair. So we, there needs to be some changes in the laws there. Um, also, uh, the U.S. power industry is, is largely self-regulated which is unlike any other industry, and that, that's a problem. And so we need some new uh, institutional arrangements uh, to uh, advance our uh, ability to prepare uh, against these uh, EMP and other existential threats. Uh, there's also intelligence, uh, national intelligence impediments, and we, uh, we re reviewed in detail and, and, cr and critiqued in detail uh, the most recent uh, uh, intelligence estimate uh, on EMP uh, capabilities and effects. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, conclusion was that that report should not be used for any decision making. Okay. There, there are problems, technical problems with it, and uh, we, we believe that there needs to be a new report, a new analog that, uh, that supersedes the existing uh, uh, intel uh, estimates. And then the uh, current institutional authorities and responsibilities within the executive and legislative uh, branches are uh, the problem, problematic. Uh, and we, we uh, believe there needs to be a, a, there's no one in charge is, is what is uh, Ambassador Cooper uh, uh, remind, reminds us. But we need a, a single executive agent uh, with authority and accountability and resources to manage uh, these prepared national preparedness for these threats. Otherwise, you get this bureaucratic finger pointing that, that uh, is just count, uh, counterproductive. Now here, uh, this is my uh, last chart. And this, uh, uh, by the way, there's a lot more detail in those, the previous charts in the, in the EMP uh, executive uh, summary, which hopefully will be uh, approved for public release. But we're hoping that will happen. But uh, we, uh, this chart, these are things, just my, uh, my uh, thoughts on this. This uh, continuing problem with self-regulation and self-assessment, uh, I think is just setting us up. I like this Mark Twain uh, quote, you tell me who's buttering your bread and I'll tell you where your opinions lie, uh, is, is I think very appropriate here. Uh, although, you know, I have immense respect for the power industry, I don't, I don't think it's right that they're doing their own vulnerability assessments and developing their own survivability criteria. Uh, I think that uh, the American people uh, are not well served by that, that, kind, that situation. Um, most of the attention to date has been on control facilities and substation transformers. Uh, there's been very little attention. I don't know how the generator operators have, have 
uh, exited from the radar screen, but, but they need to be on there. There need to be a lot more attention to the uh, generation facilities. Um, and uh, the, uh, now, and here, here, you know, just, in, you know, so th there are, uh, I think there's a lot of overlap between what the EMP community and what the electric power industry want to see happen. We all want the grid to be survivable. We all want our families to, to endure, you know, through uh, a lot, lot more generation. And uh, I won't read these, but uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, vision for the future is, w is one that I had presented at Idaho. I, I discussed with, uh, with uh, Frank Coza, and uh, there are just a lot of things we can agree on there. There's six points, I think. And, but there's a lot of encouraging signs. I, I also uh, got to get off the stage with some encouragement. Uh, there is a lot of unprompted industry uh, protection going on of uh, control facilities. Uh, there are pilot projects where we're actually going in and protecting uh, uh, re regions within Louisiana and Car the Carolinas. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, that uh, we see uh, the DHS guidelines that Kevin Briggs talked about and uh, DTRA is, uh, is op has, has opened a channel uh, for DOD uh, EMP expertise to flow to uh, the Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security and Industry. And I think that's very, very encouraging. Uh, thanks, yeah, Adam Schultz, Oregon State. Um, I thought the EPRI study was a really nice um, synthesis of how you put the various steps together and try, you know, it's really quite a complicated pro uh, process. There's been one criticism about the reference waveform that was used based on the Russian data, which seems relevant. I'd just like to point out something that was implicit in my talk that I'll make explicit here for the EPRI uh, study. Another, uh, another one of those soft spots was the grounding model, which was one dimensional. And we could easily see at a, at a given transformer, you know, 20,000% um, uh, amplification of an electric field due to the 3D component. Yeah, so these aren't small effects. And that might affect the statistics of how many failures you might see over continental scale. So. And, and we totally agree with, with the work you're doing, Adam. The, the issue is when we had to put the standard out, we were on a deadline to do it. We had to go with the information we had and therefore the one-dimensional stuff from USGS, what we had, so that's why we're where we are. Yeah, I had a question. Uh, I looked at a report from the, what is it, the National Infrastructure Protection Plan. I'm not sure what the latest date was, 2014. Uh, no mention of EMP on the prioritization on that document, nor was there any uh, other indication that they were going to look at anything like that, right? Um, was there anything done since 2014 in, in other prioritizations or documents for National Infrastructure Protection? Uh, not, not to my knowledge. Any others? Oh, one over here. Last one. Last one. <laughs> <laughs> do I get the last one? You do. Thank you. John Uhas, uh, InfraGuard and also in Cozy. Uh, appreciate the presentation very much. As with all the previous ones, we've heard a great deal about the vulnerabilities of our national grid, et cetera. And we're talking about topics of how do we make it more robust, how do we protect it, how do we uh, make it survivable, et cetera. When do we begin to address the question of how do we transform it to a more efficient architecture? Uh, one of the things we've also learned, we hear frequently, is one of the points of vulnerability is inherently derived from the fact that it's a highly centralized structure, just like several other critical infrastructures. It would seem that there's a natural transformation underway in the form of microgrids that are inherently decentralized and much less prone to this kind of uh, vulnerability. And I would, pos I would partially, I'm not saying the microgrids obviously are in, uh, EMP proof or less vulnerable in that sense, of course they're not, but they can be made so probably with much less resistance than what we're facing at the federal level. 
How do we begin that uh, to support the whole transformation process? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, there are a couple of transformations going on right now without any kind of, it's actually the, the transformations are occurring because of the marketplace. Number one is the, the generation is now being installed closer to the load. We, you know, 10, 20 years ago, when I started in the business, it, it was typical to ship power hundreds of miles away to get it to the load. What's happening now is the generation is being installed much closer to the load. You can only look outside of Washington, D.C. here. If you go into southern Maryland, there are three large power plants being built, whereas we used to worry about importing energy into Washington, D.C. That's not going to be an issue in the future. The other thing that's going on is uh, the, the implementation of renewable energy. Um, renewable energy, um, wind and solar, it, it's, it's definitely growing. In, in PJM, it's not quite a, a factor at this point because we're so big, but um, certainly on a national level, the increase in uh, renewable energy is another big big factor that's going on that's, that's, that's going to increase, I'll say, resiliency from that standpoint. So you got those two things going on, really driven by market forces more than anything else, that are, that are making the, the, uh, th the system more resilient. No, I think I think microgrids have a lot to offer, and uh, um, but they they aren't uh, they're not certainly not the total solution. We still have oil refineries and and steel plants and things that just no way uh, you're going to be able to do those without just a heavy duty uh, grid that we have now here. Okay, so we're going to end our questions. We thank our panelists. <laughs>